Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College, a program that encourages good discussion in our community on today's local and global issues. Now, your host for Conversations from St. Norbert College, author, professor, and nationally known sports economist, Dr. Kevin Quinn. Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College. I'm Kevin Quinn. Our special guest is Chris Ayers, a St. Norbert College graduate and popular Hollywood character designer and digital artist. On this show, we will talk about Ayers' career and how he's battled through cancer. Chris Ayers is a 1997 graduate of St. Norbert College. He has amassed 28 film credits, which include Men in Black 2, Austin Powers and Goldmember, The Santa Claus 2, the latest Star Trek, Incredible Hulk, and Fantastic Four. He has also written two books. His most recent book is The Daily Zoo Year Two, the sequel to the popular The Daily Zoo. Both books were created as a result of his fight with cancer of the blood in 2005. As a cancer survivor, Chris donates a portion of his book sales to cancer-related charities and research. Chris, welcome to the program. Thank you, Kevin. Now, before we get started, we're going to do something a little bit unusual that will take advantage of Chris's talent. Um, and during the show, Chris will sketch something. And we'll see various cut-ins during the show, and at the end, we'll, sh we'll show everybody. So thank you for uh, agreeing to do that. My pleasure. So before uh, we get started here, um, what exactly does a character designer do? Uh, well, uh, I'm involved in the filmmaking process uh, at the towards the very beginning, uh, before the cameras start rolling in the pre-production uh, phase of, of things. And, uh, you know, a script will usually be written, um, and, but the script is, is most often just words, and uh, you have no pictures to go with these words. And, and so the script may describe a character, uh, but then I'm, I'm involved in the process of help giving visual form to that character. What does this alien look like? What does this uh, uh, furry little squirrel character look like? Um, and so oftentimes it's starting off with a blank piece of paper uh, or, or some artwork that has been generated previously and then help to uh, fine tune the, the look of the character, uh, which will eventually then get uh, built as a costume or a, a puppet or uh, as a digital model then that we end up seeing on screen. So what's a, a life, a day in the life like? Uh, lots of drawing, um, lots of time usually spent on the computer um, and uh, trying to come up with with interesting new looks. Um, you know, aliens have been done many, many times <laughs> and so it's always a challenge to try and come up with uh, something that is a little bit fresh that uh, the audience may the audiences may not have seen before. So, so tell us about some of your your favorite characters that you've worked on, or maybe some of the characters you didn't work on that you wish you had. Um, well, I, I you know I got into this business um, just I grew up um, being uh, inspired and mesmerized by the movie monsters of my youth um, and Star Wars and the Ray Harryhausen films. And uh, so, you know, the, the reason I wanted to go into this line of work was when it looked a lot of fun, looked to be a lot of fun. But then also, um, I wanted to try and uh, be involved in the process that might inspire the next generation of kids. Uh, and um, Men in Black 2 was a lot of fun um, because uh, we had a, a great group of, of people working on that, and that always makes the work experience more enjoyable. And just what we were doing, um, I mean, drawing aliens uh, all day long for <laughs> weeks on end was, was a lot of fun. And, um, and, and in that uh, case, um, we, some of the characters had very specific directions based on the needs for, for, um, the, from the script. But then there was also a need for a lot of just background aliens. And for those, um, the, the marching orders were, give us aliens. And, and so it was really wide open. So we got to really explore uh, a lot of different directions. So, Well, you seem to be in the right place at the right time. And uh, maybe my numbers are off. But it seems that animation is and, and sort of the fanciful characters like you create it's as hot as it's ever been the last 10 or 12 years or so. There's been more than I can count. They're extremely entertaining. Uh, you know, the animation films are there for, you know, the whole family. Men in Black 2 is kind of a, you know, whole family film. Mm -hmm. um, it's a wonderful time to be working in that business, I'm guessing. 
Yeah, you know, I mean, I feel fortunate to have had the opportunities to work on the types of projects that I have, and uh, animation has really um, taken off again. Um, the uh, the Disney kind of had a rebirth with uh, The Little Mermaid and Beauty mm -hmm. and the Beast, and and uh, um, and that's continued. Um, and then certainly with Pixar coming onto the scene, and then now um, other studios like DreamWorks and Blue Sky uh, are all creating really uh, quality pictures and, and animation is seen as a, uh, a viable investment by these studios uh, and unfortunately a lot of it comes down to the money so if, if something they feel that they can make money off of doing this they'll, they'll start doing it more. So you're at the front end of the process typically right mm -hmm. or, or pretty close to the front end so you really have and people that do what you do really have uh, an imprint on the sort of the warp and woof the feel of the, of the final product. How much time do you spend at that front end? So for Men in Black 2, which came out in 2000? Uh, I worked on it in 2001. I think it, it came two... out in 2002. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. So that's, I mean, that's, that's not a lot of time, actually, to, uh, to get that done. Mm -hmm. So uh, how, how long did you work on that? Uh, I think on that project, I worked for roughly maybe about six months or so. Um, and I was I was involved in the uh, the character design process, uh, and then the the company that I was working for for that project uh, was Rick Baker's Cinovation, and so he was responsible for then turning those designs into uh, animatronic puppets or prosthetic makeup appliances for actors, um, and so they were being built right there as well. Chris, you worked on Alien vs. Predator. Uh, which side were you on? <laughs> uh, the humans. The humans. Uh, yes. <laughs> what did you do for that? Uh, I was involved in the the art department, um, and again, that was being. I was working at the creature shop, which was making the. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's 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 a, it's nice to be able to say that. Yeah, I, I work at a creature shop, um, and uh, so they were building the practical side of the uh, uh, aliens and predators there in the shop. Um, there, some was done digitally by another company. Um, but all of the, the props and the, the weapons and stuff was being made there. Um, so I, I was involved in the, the design process. And then um, after that was kind of done, I served in the art department as sort of a, a support role for um, the rest of the build of, of all of this stuff. Um, certain, uh, there'd, be, there'd be needs for an art department type of uh, assistance throughout the course of the, the build to the end of the project, um, providing, uh, and things would come up too, as, as you start to build things, you realize, oh, we forgot to design this and stuff, we need, we need a little something here, what color is this going to be? Um, and so I would kind of provide that throughout the, the course of the, the build. So how does a young man, you grew up in Minnesota, right? Mm -hmm. So how does a young man from Minnesota who goes to a liberal arts college here in you know, near Green Bay, Wisconsin. How do you wind up in the film business? How does this happen? Uh, you know, I think I'm, I'm no different from just about anyone else out in the L.A. film business who is not originally from L.A. That you, you ask people and they all have their own individual stories of, of that lucky break that happens because it is a combination of uh, timing and being in the right place at the right time. Um, to, to at least get a foot in the door, but then it's re really dependent upon you, uh, your, your personality and your skills and whatever you can bring to the job in order to, uh, to stay in that door, not get kicked out. Um, I had always dreamed about working in the movies uh, ever since I was a little kid, uh, but it wasn't really until um, uh, my experience here at St. Norbert and specifically my uh, semester of studying abroad in Florence, Italy as a junior that, uh, that I really gained the confidence and the, the idea that yes, I'm going to go out to LA at some point in my life and give this a shot. Before it had always been, you know, kind of a, in the back of my head, oh, wouldn't that be nice? And it didn't really have a sense of tangibility, but um, I came back from Italy and I just, I knew, I told my parents, um, you know, I'm going to move out to L.A. at some point. And, and they were very supportive. I was a little hesitant, you know, <laughs> what are they going to 
you know, how are they going to react? But um, they were very, very supportive. Um, and uh, so a few years after graduation, um, I, I packed up the car um, to the ceiling and, and drove out to L.A. I knew one person out there. He was a friend from grade school, uh, and he had just moved out there a few months before, before me. And, um, and, and basically, I ended up buying my way into, <laughs> into the business. Um, I went to a silent auction for a school fundraiser and um, a, a behind-the-scenes tour to this uh, special effects um, facility, Amalgamated Dynamics, um, was up for bid. The minimum bid was 100 bucks, and I had just moved out there. I didn't have a job. You know, I'm thinking, ooh, that's, that's kind of steep. But I also realized that you wouldn't be able to get this type of experience by just knocking on a door um, and saying, hey, can I see what you do? Um, and, uh, at, you know, I thought, well, I'll bring along a portfolio too, and, and maybe I'll have a chance to show somebody or make some sort of connection or get some advice on how to break into the industry. Um, I went on the tour, I won the bid, and, uh, and, and ultimately that's what gave me my first break. I showed them my work and then a week later they called me in for a few days worth of work. And then uh, like a month later then they called me in for another project and then it was pretty much, I haven't looked back since then. So everyone really, you know, you need that, that little bit of luck to, uh, to, get, to get noticed and, and to have somebody take a chance on you really. Well, now you're smack dab in the middle of the business. What? And it's a business, and you know, mm -hmm. probably I, I study sports primarily, but sports is an entertainment business. It can be pretty ruthless, uh, kind of an industry. What? Uh, what has surprised you most about that industry? Do you still enjoy movies when you go to them, or can you not just get past <laughs> any of that other stuff? Uh, it is a different experience watching movies. Um, when you are involved in the movie making process because you do see a lot of the behind the scenes um, work that goes into the final product and um, you know it, it it does I suppose um, take take a little bit of the magic away um, but at the same time it, you, you also look on it. You look at it with with fresh eyes and and can see, oh, that's how they did that. And I wonder, you know, I, I do notice more, um, especially with the type of things that I'm involved with uh, in the character design. I mean, I'm very critical uh, of of characters in movies, and and I I'll go with my wife to. Um, a movie, and then afterwards, I'll say, "Oh, you know, I, I, I just those the eyelids of that lizard just kind of bugged me." And she <laughs> looks at me like I'm crazy, like, "What?" <laughs> um, but uh, it, it, it's I still do enjoy going to movies because it's such a um, a creative business. Usually, I mean, there's a lot of non-creative decisions made, unfortunately, but um, movies are still basically art. Um, and, and there's a lot of fantastic visuals to see there, so it's always inspiring. Well, uh, the, the industry must be doing something right because they can still get a lot of people to part with uh, 10 bucks a ticket and, <laughs> and to, to have a wonderful hour and a half experience. And uh, there, there's more and more media by which you know, people can get this stuff, so um, you know, you're doing work that's going to live forever. It, it, that's got to be kind of a cool thing to know. Yeah, it's it's nice to be a part of of that, um, and again to perhaps help create something that that does uh, inspire and kind of ignite the imaginations of the next generation of dreamers, really. Um, and you know, we're we are a storytelling culture, and we're always going to be telling stories. I hope, uh, but I think, I mean since it, it's just that the, the delivery has changed from the oral tradition of the Greeks and, and theater and, um, and, you know, radio, and now it's, it's uh, film and, and uh, you know, books still. Um, we're going into 3D a little bit, but, you know, there, I think there's still going to be that need to, uh, to record what has happened and then our, our values as a society. And... Uh, and then, you know, we always need monsters, too. So, you know, I think there's storytelling in general may change the, the delivery, but um, that, that aspect of it is always going to be around, I think. Well, you're not only 
in the movie business, you're in the book business too. And uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, especially let's talk about The Daily Zoo and your newest book, The Daily Zoo 2. Um, those are particularly personal books for you. Um, tell us how that came about. Uh, well, um, life was going along very smoothly and, and I, I felt my career rising. Um, making friends, making contacts, working on some great projects out in, in Hollywood. And then on April Fool's Day uh, in 2005, I was diagnosed with cancer. I had had a, a sore throat that just wasn't going to go away um, and, uh, and then finally saw my doctor and they did, ran some tests and there was a, a few weeks where they were trying to figure out what exactly was, was wrong with me but then they, uh, they told me one afternoon that yes, I'm sorry, we have a serious problem. Um, you've got leukemia, um, which turned out to be acute myelogenous leukemia, which is a type of blood cancer. And then that, that evening I was uh, hospitalized at UCLA and had tubes being stuck in me and uh, and then a few days later is when I started my treatment program um, which involved chemo and, and radiation and, and ultimately a stem cell transplant. Uh, and then if we fast forward through the, <laughs> the nasty part, it was, it was several months of uh, intense treatment in and out of the hospital and then it was a long recovery process um, of just slowly regaining my strength and, and um, kind of getting back on my feet. And then as I was approaching the one-year anniversary of my original diagnosis uh, in April of 2006 now, uh, physically I was feeling fairly back to normal. Um, my energy levels were, were close to what they were before the cancer. Um, but I still had, uh, my, my head was kind of very, it, it, it it was very jumbled and I needed to help process what had just happened. I needed to help uh, my mental and emotional recovery still. And I figured that perhaps the best way for me to do that was to turn to uh, a couple of things that have always provided um, some comfort to me throughout my life and that was uh, drawing and animals. I've always been fascinated with animals and I've always been drawing for as long as I can remember. So I figured if I can combine those those two lifelong passions and focus on those and focus on them on a daily basis it would it would be a good thing I didn't quite know how it would affect me um, and but I just I had a, a feeling that this would be at, at the very least it would be fun and I needed some fun after going through the cancer I treatments. Can imagine <laughs> so um, so I gave myself the goal of drawing one animal each day for the following year and I called it the daily zoo and um, I, on April 1st, 2006, I drew my first animal. It was a blue-footed booby, and I haven't looked back since then. I've, I've continued drawing it. Um, after the first year, I realized it, it was so therapeutic and so rewarding uh, and so much fun, too, that I just I kept going. And, um, and I just started year six uh, last week, um, and I'm wow. on day 1833 or 34 today, I think. Wow. So it's, it's just been, it's been very therapeutic for me. So did you ever cheat? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, <laughs> no. I, I, every day I have um, sat down and, and come up with some sort of an idea. Some of them are, are much looser than others. Um, and, and when I've published the books, I have gone back to some of them and, and continued working on them to bring them to a little bit more finished state. But every day it's, it's uh, sitting down and, and giving myself that little gift of of uh, playing and exploring my own imagination and creativity. Uh, there have been days when, when I've almost forgotten and I've gotten into bed and the lights are out and my head is on the pillow and, and then I realize, oh, I haven't done the, the daily zoo yet. So I have to get up, back up out of bed and, and, uh, and, and do that. So. How long does it take to do one of those? Because they're, I mean, they're pretty elaborate and it's not just the drawing part of it. I mean, that's moving your hands around, but the, the between the ears part, is it must take a long time. Well, the be between the ears part is, I think, I don't know that it ever shuts off. I mean, uh, throughout the course of the day, I'm I'm just I, I'm always looking and always have my my all my senses open to uh, the world around me. I mean, th there's so many ins inspirational and interesting things to this planet and that we that we uh, inhabit. Um, the sights, the colors, the sounds, the people, the places. Uh, so I'm always 
gathering, kind of soaking up potential ideas. But um, as far as uh, when I sit down to do a sketch, uh, sometimes I will have an idea already that I'd like to do. Uh, sometimes it is just um, created on the fly as I go. I put that pencil down and start moving and I don't know where I'm going to go. Um, and some of the uh, sketches are, you know, very quick, very loose, five minutes, ten minutes. Um, but if, if, it's, if I have the time and energy and if the, the character starts to, to um, appear and, it, and it's an interesting character, I'll get very uh, involved in it and, uh, you know, hours can pass without, without me noticing it. So. Wow, that's, ama that's amazing. Um, you're watching uh, Conversations from St. Norbert College. Joining us is St. Norbert College graduate, Hollywood character designer, and digital artist, Chris Ayers. Chris, uh, you talked a little bit about uh, your unfortunate experience with cancer. Um, I'm sure you don't want to dwell on it a lot, but I'm sure people would want to know. Um, from what I understand, somewhere between a third and a half of all Americans will get cancer at some point in their lives. But very few are going to have the experience that you had, you know, as a young person with something that was so life-threatening and so miserable to, to get through. Some of the pictures that, uh, that uh, you know, I saw on your website, you know, made it, it didn't make it look like fun. Um, what, what was that like on a daily basis? I mean, how did that feel? Uh, well, I mean, it, it, it's, it is. You're right. It's not fun. Um, uh, it, it is a definitely a battle. And, and every uh, cancer... Uh, is, is a little bit different, and every patient's experience is, is different, too, um, even with the same type of cancer, depending on, on the type of treatment that is, they're undergoing and, uh, and, and their own personal medical histories and genetics and, and everything. Um, but uh, you get poked a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of needles, a lot of fluids being taken from you, a lot of stuff going in you, different medicines. Um, you do... You, your your pride is one of the first things to go. I mean, you're in a hospital gown. You lose your hair. You lose weight. You you know you you feel awful and um, and you don't care about your physical appearance at all because you just focus want to focus on on trying to get better. Um, the fatigue was one of the uh, things I remember the most is just how completely exhausted um, I, I was. Uh, you know, and I remember doing many all-nighters for projects here at St. Norbert and, and uh, you know, partying and studying and everything. And, and I, I would go home on spring break and, and sleep for almost the entire week. So I, I thought I knew exhaustion, but the leukemia exhaustion was, was far and away um, much, much uh, worse than, than anything that I had experienced before. Um, so yeah, it wasn't, and there was ma many, many uh, different tests. Every every day, it seemed like there was uh, some new procedure or something that they they had to do. Uh, the nurses would come in in the morning and say, "Okay, it looks like you're going to have a lumbar tap today." And um, and one of the ways that I tried to deal with that was um, kind of almost fool my my brain into thinking that you know this is a, uh, an adventure. And well, I've never had a lumbar tap before, so let's give it a shot. I wonder what it'll be like. Um, just trying to put a positive spin on it, and uh, and and I, I I found myself referring to the hospital as the hotel uh, many times, and and it wasn't a conscious thing. I would just I'd slip up and I'd say, oh, we have to go back to the hotel, and uh, I mean you get room service, meals are brought to you, you get waited on hand and foot. Uh, so I think it, maybe that was a defense mechanism um, too of just trying to to treat this. As uh, as a vacation, <laughs> rather than uh, what it was actually what was actually happening. So, how do you think that whole experience has changed you? Uh, it's changed me on many many ways, and I mean, I do feel fortunate that well, one that that I'm I'm here today and feeling good, and, and my health is good, and I haven't had any further major complications. But um, it it. Uh, you know, I was 29 when I was diagnosed, and uh, which I felt was fairly young, though my doctor said my age would be working against me, and I was like, really? Um, because it's much more uh, treatable uh, the younger you are that, with the t specific mm. type of leukemia that I had. But, uh, you know, I feel very fortunate to have uh, gone through something like that and come out the other side at a relatively young age because it has... Um, 
enhanced my appreciation for many, many things in life. Um, just feeling the breeze on your face, uh, that's something that most people probably take for granted. Um, or when it rains out and they get wet and it's like, oh, okay, I'm, you know, where's my umbrella? But uh, there's something, when, you, when you're stuck inside a hospital room for a month at a time and you can't even get the, any sort of uh, fresh air or the, uh, the breeze coming in or, or the sun on your face, uh, it makes you realize uh, and, and just, just how much there is um, to be appreciative and grateful for in life. So to have gone through that at a relatively young age, I mean, now I, I hope to live a long and prosperous life, uh, but I have that, that experience to, to help uh, guide my outlook and, and, and uh, shape my experiences as I, as I go forward. So that flat tire on the way to work is not quite as serious as it once was, I'm guessing. Not quite as serious. I mean, I still get uh, upset and frustrated sometimes, but then it, it, it's an easy uh, sort of a, a checks and balances. It's like, whoa, you know, this isn't a big deal. You know, I may get frustrated in the moment, but then it's like, whoa, hey, come, you know, this isn't cancer. This is, you know, so, um, so yeah, it's, it's a good little uh, weapon to have in, my, <laughs> in, my, in the back of my head when, when things get tough. Well, let's talk about some happier times. Let's talk about your time here at uh, St. Norbert College. And I'm just curious, uh, were you a studious person? You mentioned that uh, maybe you know you had partied once in a while, which, uh, by the way, none of our students do. Um, <laughs> so you were the only one. Um, what, what kind of a student were you when you were here? Uh, well, I'll defer remember that. one of your professors is I know. in the, is in the, <laughs> <laughs> I'll is in the studio that here. Question to uh, <laughs> no, I, I felt that um, I was uh, a, a good student. Um, I mean, I took. The, the classwork very seriously, especially my art classes, but really all of my classes. I, um, I've always enjoyed school and I've enjoyed being in the classroom and I, and I want to learn. And, um, and that's one of the, the first things you have to do as a student. I think you have to bring yourself to the classroom ready to, I mean, it, it's not just that the teachers are going to talk and you're gonna absorb it magically and then you're gonna walk out of there enlightened. I mean, you have to do a lot of the work, and not just the homework, but you have to pay attention in class and be engaged and, and involved in the discussion. And so I, I felt like I had a good attitude and, and I really wanted to get the most out of uh, this college experience and especially uh, with the art classes. I mean, this is, I knew I wanted to do something art related in my career. I wasn't quite sure exactly what that would be when I first started here, but uh, I wanted to, put myself in the best position to have a, a, a successful career once I got out of here. So that meant being studious and, and I realized that the art faculty here and, and really all the faculty members that I had really had some good, they knew what they were talking about for the most part. You know, they, they had a lot to offer and so I just wanted to take advantage of that opportunity and get as much as I could uh, while I was here because four years does go by quickly. Um, but having said that, I did uh, in, enjoy the social life as well because I think that is part of the college experience and, and uh, it was important to um, build some, some friendships as well, which I've fortunately continued to this day. So, What's the best advice you got when you were here, do you know? Do you remember? Whew. Um, How about the worst? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't remember a specific nugget of, of wisdom or anything, but I, I think it was just that, um, specifically the art faculty, I remember getting, I, I, I got to know them one-on-one uh, -on -one and develop um, some good relationships with them and uh, just their, their guidance, their kind of consistent guidance throughout the four years here. Um, was was very very helpful and and you just you know it was it wasn't like any one one thing but um, it was just a lot of a lot of little things along the way that that just started to soak in and uh, and you know I, I do feel very appreciative of that. Well, I, actually, I think that's good advice for any career that you want to get into. Yes, so exactly. thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I think we could go probably another hour <laughs> if we could, but they're waving at me over here. Um, I hope you've enjoyed our show today. Until next time, I'm Kevin Quinn. Best wishes for good conversations from St. Norbert College. <laughs> <laughs>